On June 1st, 2023, I had the incredible fortune of speaking with Brian Griffin. He is one of the most gifted, creative, and innovative artists I have ever met. His sharp eye for the surreal, working person, and industrial images put him on the globe as a maverick in the field of photography. In this very special interview, he spoke candidly about life growing up in black country, phenomenal subject projects, and some of his most memorable album covers for bands such as Depeche Mode, Echo and the Bunnymen, and many more. You will be dazzled with his PowerPoint presentation because of his ability to articulate himself with such energy and passion. Yes, we lost a true pioneer in the art world, but remember this, he left behind a treasure trove of gifts that will never go out in photographic mode. See you on the other side of the lens, Mr. Griffin. Thank you. A little D mode for you all. Hello, everyone. My name is W, also known as William. Welcome to this very special event. I am the host of High Art on the Edge. Today is going to be a fun-filled day as you will be educated and entertained as we have a very special guest with us, a world-renowned photographer. You may be familiar with his work as he has worked with Depeche Mode, Brian May, um, Peter Gabriel, Echo and the Bunnymen, R.E.M., the list goes on and on. But he's also done some other amazing photographs that you will have a chance to take a look at, along with a brand new Kickstarter campaign. So excited to talk about that and how it's meeting its goal. Brian Griffin, how are you? I am very well indeed. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks for being here. Oh, it's a pleasure. Oh, I've got a glass of water. You've got a, a cup of coffee. <laughs> I do have my coffee. I'm so excited to uh, have you here and um, dive into your work. So, Brian, um, yeah. I've got two words for you. I want to start this conversation with two words. Very simple. Black country. When you hear those two words, what comes to mind? Black country. My early part of my life, which has been really important to my art, as you could say, the influence of the black country. The black country being known for steel, coal, industrial. Yeah. It reminds me when I came to America, you know, Pennsylvania, Allentown or whatever, or it reminds me of Dresden, not Dresden, uh, um, the Ruhr Valley in Germany, a big industrial dark black area, <laughs> you know. That was my early early uh, christening to this, this planet. For people that aren't familiar with black country, where exactly is it? It sits next to Birmingham. It's not Birmingham. Birmingham is not in the black country. Birmingham is a city unto itself. It's about 10 miles, 10, maybe eight to 10 miles in height. And this is like on the map. And uh, also probably eight miles wide. And uh, it's a very specific area. And uh, you, you can tell a black country person because they, I could not speak English until I was well into my teens. I spoke in dialect, you know, so uh, until I was about uh, maybe 15 years old before I could speak proper English or a form of English. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so with you growing up in Birmingham, take us back to those times of um, through education. Did you enjoy your schooling back then? What kind of a student were you? How did you get into photography? So on and so forth. Wow, that's quite a lot. Okay, um, one, I think I was a naughty boy at school. Although I was, uh, I was studious, you know, I was a, a good, I, I was in the lower, uh, 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 when I was in junior school, I was really at the, not the bottom of the class, but virtually towards the bottom. 
And I, I created a miracle. We had a, a thing called 11 plus examination, which would then could possibly take us to grammar school. And I passed that, passed that exam and went to, gra well, a formal grammar school, a technical school, uh, which we were talking earlier about Robert Plant. He went to grammar school, my grammar school uh, in my area. And I went to technical school in my area. Um, then um, uh, we, we'll just go very quickly. Uh, then I had to, because parents wanted me to leave school and earn some money, and I left at 16, which was too young to leave. I, I could not, you know, take my, what we call A-levels in England, which would then take you on to grammar, in, on to university if you pass them. Uh, no, I left and went into a factory. You know, I was in a factory watching the rats play next to the canal that ran next to the factory I worked in. And uh, I became a photographer um, about about two years later, about the age of 18, I joined a ca local camera club, one of those amateur affairs that we have around the world, you know, where, where people meet once a week or go on trips together to click their expensive cameras. I was, I, I, I was working down in the, on the floor of a factory, cutting, welding, you know, all those basic jobs that you do in a factory that, does cutting or welding uh, of steel, that is. And um, and the, the man who was uh, next to me, uh, with a big, we call sledgehammers in England, or what you call them in, in America, a bit like the uh, construction time, again, of Depeche Mode, like wielding that sledgehammer. Uh, as he spoke to me, he said, have you ever been interested in photography? And I said, no, <laughs> which I wasn't. <laughs> And he said, well, come round to the camera club. You might find it interesting. So I went round to the camera club and I joined the camera club as a beginner. In fact, I've, I've been in touch with them over the last maybe four or five years. And I said, I, I grew up in your camera club. I never had a reply. They don't give a damn about me back where I came from. Uh, only a few people think of any, of any interest in what I'm up to. They're into, I don't know, all sorts of things, going down the pub or or whatever, I don't know what they put them into over there. Go on. Tell us a little bit about your relationship with your mom and your dad or siblings. Um, and and uh, did your either your parents support your love for photography in the early stages? Yes, they did in the early stages. When I was still at work, I, I, I built a, a sort of uh, a portable dark room in my my parents, it's a really small two up, two down house. I mean, the working classes lived in really terraced houses in England, very Victorian Edwardian streets and uh, and they're very small rooms and uh, like two up, two down. I didn't have any brothers or sisters, by the way. And I took over the back room, which was like the, the form, more formal of the rooms, um, very small rooms, as, as my dark room, you know. Yeah. And they supported me then, but when I said I wanted to go and do photography, they didn't support that very well at all. They took that really, they took that really uh, harshly. Well, why? They thought, well, I was in a good job. I mean, I graduated then at the age of twenty-one to be well, a pipework engineering estimator in nuclear power station pipework, steam pipework, things like that. I had a a job that would have a job for life, you know, um, and they they recognised that, you know. I, I was a white collar worker. I'd come out of, out of working in a factory to be a white collar worker, meaning that you had an office job, um, and uh, you know, it was like I'd come home as clean as I went, basically. Um, whilst my dad would come home covered in absolute dreadful, he was, which killed him in the end, and. Uh, he was a machinist, and my mother worked in the factory as well. She was just bagging nails, you know, just bagging nails. And my father was a horizontal borer in the factory. So, uh, yeah, they, they had dreadful jobs whilst I came back. They probably admired me because I, I came back immaculate as when I went, which I dressed in a suit, tie, and, you know, and shirt, white shirt. We dressed very formally in those days. We didn't go all sort of, I don't know, casual. To offices. So thank you for sharing that. And so we know your images have been directly connected to iconic oh. album covers and really important bands and mm -hmm. artists. 
When you were exploring photography in the early stages, did music play a role in the inspiration of capturing images? Yeah, I mean, I had a discotheque uh, one day a week. Um, my friend John Crampton and myself, we, we had a discotheque in a pub about seven or eight miles away from our, from our homes. Our homes, excuse me, I can't understand my ages. And uh, we did on a Wednesday night. In fact, when, this is interesting. When Robert Plant actually went on tour with Led Zeppelin, his yeah. wife came to our discotheque. So she must have thought it was an interesting discotheque. We were playing what you could call, like we played everybody from uh, the Groundhogs to, uh, to uh, um, uh, I used to think of somebody else, oh, no, loads of bands in the 70s. Uh, we played, um, oh, God, obviously Bob Dylan. Uh, obviously, um, we played uh, Leonard Cohen and... Uh, we played uh, uh, Hendrix, of course, and um, like all those uh, progressive bands of the late 60s. We had a great discotheque, really basic amplification, really like the cheapest possible coming through one speaker. Yeah. <laughs> and the guy who took the money, took the money on uh, at the door, I think it was probably about a shilling or two shillings, which is 5p or 10p to get in. And uh, there was a bar in there as well because it was in a pub. And uh, we drank the money away, actually. <laughs> we drank <laughs> all the attendance money away in those days. Um, well, he certainly did on the door. I couldn't drink it all the way because I had a car to drive the gear back home, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I grew up with music. And the, and, and the area I grew up in was extremely musical, musical in a strange way because I as I was talking earlier, I, I do like electronic music and uh, the sounds of all the factories around me. You know, you had the, the tapping of the of the bath and bucket works, you know, doo -doo 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 -doo. and then you had the forges that come down, boha, boha, and then you had the steel rolling mills where they were rolling all the steel. And uh, there were all these sounds, you know, both uh, that I remember in my childhood. A cacophony was happening around where I lived in the Black Country, and I and I fell in love with that again. Actually, in the in the eighties, especially, and in the nineties, definitely. Um, so you like those textures? Yeah, I do. Yeah, those aural textures. So at that time, when you were becoming a photographer, was there an image or two? uh that really inspired you to be like yeah that's kind of what i want to do well sorry it's rather deflating what i'm going to say in the sense that i thought that i could do something in the music industry and uh, i wanted to develop by this time we're talking about late 70s and um i wanted uh to do album sleeves so I went round to one of the major record labels at the time, an independent label called Stiff Records, and um, I got a job straight away. I just well, took my folio in. They loved my portfolio of other things apart from music, as you said kindly said earlier. Um, <clears throat> and they loved my work, so I got Graham Parker's Parkerilla. That was the first album cover I did. <clears throat> and then and after I'd done that, I got worked with Lena Lovitch quite a bit. Uh, I really thought Lena Lovitch was amazing, amazing artist. Yeah. And I'm sorry to have, have lost her in the end, you know, lost her in the sense that the record company didn't want to work me to work with her anymore. So they thought my work was too arty. But anyway, yeah, that's what started me off. But Elvis, I thought Elvis was Steve Records at the time, but he'd left Steve and he went to Radar Records, which is a Warner Brothers label in the late 70s. He left Steve, although he was on Steve initially. And uh, I worked with Elvis as well. A few covers for Elvis I did all the way through the, the 70s and the 80s. Um, anyway, I'll wrap it. But why did you want to get into album art covers? <clears throat> I, I, because I wanted to increase my income, I think. I wanted to increase my output in photography. And I wanted to increase my income as a professional photographer. And that was the means to that at that time. That seems to be the lucrative job. Yeah. For up-and-coming photographers. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I mean, I had a uh, quite a good portfolio by then. Yeah. Because uh, you're interested in the 70s in my work. And uh, 
and I had a weird code for it. I was like nobody else, really. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, as I said to you earlier, I think something came from growing up in the black country, left me with images that were indelible, that were implanted in my brain that I could not rid of, and they, they actually, they just stated and became part of my inspirations, really. The um, and I understand you're a big fan of um, surrealism, Renaissance work. Is that correct? That's correct. I mean, I was, yeah, of course, I was very fond of, and still am very fond of surrealism. I would go, like, when it became the 80s, for instance, uh, I would go and stay in a hotel uh, right next to Dali's house. You know, so I, I thought I could see Dali in, in the garden or whatever. Um, I, I was really, really thought of surrealism, although people sort of thought of me as a surrealist. They sort of in they labelled me as a surrealist, so I sort of adopted it in a funny sort of way. I took their lead, really, my, the onlookers or the people that saw my work. Uh, most definitely, yeah. When did you start feeling like you were establishing yourself as a name? Very interesting question. I think it took me a long time. I think the 80s really started to do that. And they started to grow so considerably, my fame and fortune in the 80s. Like that, I was almost like a rock star in a sense. I adopted almost a rock star's lifestyle or, or the bad side of the rock star's lifestyle. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it just got to such an extent, my fame in the 80s that, well, I left photography for 12 years after that. I'd done, I, I just wanted to carry on doing film instead of photography. I thought so I'd done when, everything in photography. That was very naive of me, of course. It's so how did you handle that meteor, meteoric rise to fame? Badly. Badly? Badly, yeah. Um, Stuff uh, we can't talk about. <laughs> I'm sorry? Stuff we can't talk about right now. <laughs> yeah, that sort of stuff. Uh, I had a studio down in Rotherhithe in the 80s, which is where I live now still. Been down here 42 years in this area. So it's on the east side, southeast side of London, right dead central, really, quite near Tower Bridge, if you want a sort of a, a geographical position of it. Um, and uh, so it's not out of town, really. It's right in there. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I just lost it somehow. I just, my, my life just, uh, I, I realised I was losing it a bit. Um I had a lot of, uh, I felt a lot of anxiety through the 80s. I overworked. I'm a workaholic, still am a workaholic, seven days a week. And uh, it really overtook me until I started to get affected by it, really, both in terms of lifestyle and in terms of health, I think. Not that I had any bad issues of health. I just, I just sort of had, like, yeah, anyway, yeah. Do you remember what? elevated you out of that kind of cavernous dark times in your life was it a friend was it just you kind of hit rock bottom and you said you had enough what was the catalyst for that change i thought it's because i if i tell you it's a really horrible probably a lot of people won't like what i say uh, i became so famous that i thought i could become a top movie director and that's what changed me in this in in uh, 1990, uh, 1991, uh, I'd done a commercial, a big commercial, a series of three commercials in 1989 as just a side, a side thing I did through the year. But then I adopted it as, uh, as my main form of income. My main I would not do photography at all. I locked all my cameras away into a steel cabinet and did not open that cabinet for, for a number of years, really. What film directors inspired you? Were you a, uh, or are you a Lynch fan? Were you a Charlie of course, Chaplin? Of you know I am. I mean, you know I'm a Lynch fan. <laughs> and David and I started doing the same sort of things way back, uh, way back in the 70s when he brought out uh, Eraserhead. I mean, Eraserhead was sort of right, hit me right in the solar plexus in a way. I mean, I was right there. That is it was so like as if he was a, a clone of, I was a clone of him or he was a clone of me. Uh -huh. And um, I, I love, I mean, as you know, like the, we were going to go on and talk about that. Only when I lose myself, 
by Depeche Mode is a very, very dark film. And uh, you can see the influences of, well, or his influences on me or my influences on him uh, in that film. Um, I don't know if he even knows I exist, actually. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. Are you a fan of Charlie Chaplin and his kind of examination of the of the working man? I, I like I, I like Chaplin's work. I like Keaton's work, but I, I really like Tati, the French French film director. He was my favorite. Tati, okay. at the time I was making films, but at the time when I wasn't making films and the influences of filmmaking or of film directors or, or of films on my work was more of. Um, more in terms of the German silent cinema of the, you know, around about 1920, the late teens, the early 20s, the, you know, it, whether it was In for Murder or whether it was Metropolis or whether it was, it, it was, whether it was perhaps Murnau or Lang. Um, mm. I mean, I loved all that period. That, that influenced my black and white film work. But then I, I started to get strongly influenced as I, as I moved through the 70s, into the late 70s, into... Film noir. I absolutely loved film noir and the American side of the, you know, the B movies, film noir. I mean, and then I remember Martin Parr has always been a great friend of mine and I admire him tremendously. Great photographer. He, uh, me and him were so influenced by a book called Evidence that came out in um, America in 19, was it 76? I'm taking that from memory. Book called Evidence by Mike Mandel and Larry Salton. Okay. Um, I remember that. I met Mike Mandel. He came to England, actually, to a festival that I was part of. But uh, anyway, that was a great influence. That had a real major effect on, on me. And I love Diane Keaton's photo books. I just want to get that in. I think she's produced some great photographs, photography books, rather. Um, okay. So you're now you climb out of that dark hole. You're into film, film noir. What yeah. is it about film noir that gravitates towards you? Like, why do you really absorb it? Well, I think primarily it's because the black country looked like that back then. It was like me, I was going home and watching like the, the film noir, I was watching the actions happening in this, the back streets or the side streets or the high streets or in my home or whatever. Uh, it was of that quality, that black and white shadowy world of film noir. Uh, I love it. And that hard, you know, the hard light that's coming from the molten steel and putting dark shadows on the walls or the, you know, and I used to peer into the steelworks and uh, I worked in the steelworks as a student. I like, for instance, uh, some great reward, a Depeche Mode album cover I did, was the steelworks I worked in during my holidays, in, 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 um, in the holidays of, of, of being at uh, university. Well, it's not unit, it was an art college then, art college, yeah. And when was that shot, 83, 84? Uh, when was it shot? Was it 84? It, I, I'm terrible at that, but. Yeah, someone will my, home, my home used to look after, my home used to look upon that steelworks, although that steelworks was about, a mile and a half, two miles, English miles away. And um, it would light the sky when they let the furnaces off. All the sky would be a glowing red. And uh, it sat like a big ocean liner on top of a hill, massive steelworks. And uh, it, it governed the whole area in terms of its, I don't know, its light on the weekends when they let the furnaces off. So I'm um, just going to take a little pause here and recognize some people. My name is W, also known as William, host of the High Art on the Edge page. I'm here speaking with legendary photographer Brian Griffin. Uh, we have some friends tuning in from London. Uh, Eva, thank you. Uh, oh, Eva, Simon, I know Eva. Say hello for uh, me, yeah. Simon as well. Uh, Tina from Cologne. Frank. I know Tina very well. Hi, Tina. Uh, from Breer, 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 Breerly Hill. I'm not sure where that is. Frank, yeah, Frank. He, he lives quite near the steelworks. We've just been talking. Okay. Uh, Peter Marshall says hello. And Eleanor. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, so actually, Simon has a question for you. 
And um, Simon Hill, you know, is it Simon Hill? Yes, it is Simon oh, yeah, Hill. Yeah, great. Uh, his question is, uh, and we're going to get in, I was just actually going to start moving into uh, your actual technical equipment. Which lenses have served best when shooting portraits? This is a very interesting question, actually, because you're not going to believe this. Uh, well, you might believe it. Uh, I only ever used one lens in all my photography. All my photography in the album cover times yeah. uh, was done with the the 150 millimeter, 150 millimeter lens on the Hasselblad camera, which is a six by six centimeter, obviously format. Uh, and then since I inherited um, digital cameras, uh, like I started with a Mamiya camera, which then was bought by Phase One. I've always used a Mamiya zoom lens, which is a 70 to 200 millimeter zoom lens. Um, that's that's all I've ever used in all my career, with occasional, very very isolated use of uh, a 50 millimeter standard lens uh, or 85 millimeter on the. Um, on the Asselblad, or I think, what is it, is it 80, 80, 85, 80 millimeter on the phase one, I think. I think it's 80, I think so. So I've only ever used two real, two to three lenses in all my career, of which one is obviously a zoom, is like, because it's 70 to, to, to uh, 200, it's a zoom. I love telephoto lenses. I've photographed almost everything I've ever photographed, which gives me my feel because I like to compress perspective, mm -hmm. uh, which the telephoto lens does, you know, and um, and it also produces. Well, going back to surrealism, our discussion on surrealism is the juxtaposition. You bring two elements in two separate elements, which the surrealist did, right? a juxtaposition of elements, and you can compress them and bring them, unite them together a lot better with a telephoto lens but obviously you have you want me to carry on about the technical side of it well so what i was thinking is when we start looking at some of your photos your, right. your projects maybe you yeah. can share a little bit more in detail if you don't mind but yeah. um how important is clarity or sharpness to you immense i'm really into sharpness i'm almost like i'm a real geek when it comes to sharpness and it's great, obviously, with a, with, with a, these days being piped from my into from my computer from my sorry my camera to my computer. One can check on sharpness and things, and that involves quite a few things, which I was going to discuss before we broke away into sharpness. Was one you need a tremendous amount of light to bring in two objects which are separated from each other. You need a lot of power, <coughs> and if you're going to use a a small f-stop, you know, I call it small because the, the hole's small, but some people say a large or whatever. In other words, like f-16 or f-11 or something like that, you need a lot of power to pump into this subject, you know. Um, that is the, the, the downfall of that way of working, to get sharpness in two elements that are separate from each other. But as far as, say, photographing a face or something like that, mm -hmm. I'm really into maximum sharpness. So therefore, I always shoot on... Uh, the, well, these days, anyways, uh, on a six by six, uh, on a medium format camera, you know, I like to get a little better quality than the DSLR generally. As you are learning all this as you go, is there a teacher, a mentor, that really provided a lot of insight into the world of photography that you feel like you owe a bit of gratitude towards? I owe gratitude towards my assistants were an additive effect on everything we've photographed. Uh, well, not everything, but a lot of times we've done different photographs. I mean, they are really helpful. Um, I've never had anybody to teach me anything in all my career. I've had to teach myself. Like when I left art college as a photography student of three years, I'd studied art college. I had to start again, really, from basics. I didn't know anything when I was at art college, nothing. Nothing at all. I just left and had to learn everything again. Or I didn't learn anything there, so I had to learn everything about yeah. photography. Is there such a thing as a mistake in photography? 
the stakes are fantastic. I love mistakes. Some of the best photographs I've ever taken are, are due to mistakes. <laughs> uh, they really are great mistakes. I love it when they happen. Oh, they're just wonderful. They can be absolutely marvelous things. Um, shall we take a look at some of your work? If you want to. You don't have to, but you can have a look if you want. Uh, I think I want to. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, look, now, everyone, we are in the classroom with our student, Brian Griffin, who's going to share some of his work and talk about it. And if you have any questions, uh, go ahead, put them in the uh, comment box. Uh, we have Thomas here from, uh, Tomas from Sweden, uh, Eva, Sharon, all the way from Israel, and uh, Eleanor Thorne. Do you know Eleanor Thorne? I do. Okay. Now, Helen is just up the street. What a That's wonderful what she said. lady. <laughs> She's a she's wonderful there. lady. She's a rather eyed lady, and I often see her in uh, cycling or in the street and say hello. She's a very highly educated, wonderful lady. Yeah. She says, "I'm a neighbor living where Brian had his first studio on this street." She lives in my studio above my old studio. <laughs> it doesn't right, exist so anymore. It's a block of flats, and she lives above it. Um, why I'm getting this all ready? Can you quickly tell us? How has this black country changed in its appearance? In its oh, it's totally different. There's no big heavy engineering anymore. I mean, England, at least the workshop of the world, the black country was, and uh, there's none of that left, hardly any of it left. It's all small industrial parks, a bit like, like the outskirts of LA, really. Um, just like just small companies operating in massive, uh, um, massive industrial parks of small companies and no longer is it like big factories belching out smoke and, and making incredible noises. For, uh, now it's just all very small. Now it's different. Uh, are you ready to share? I'm ready. I'm ready to rock. Here we go. So right now, everyone, we're going to take a look at some of Brian's projects. So and I can share, on yeah. On so his I can website. Share. Yeah. yeah. Can you see this, Brian? I can, absolutely. Okay. We're going to start with the big tie here. And um, I want to go to... That's uh, in, uh, that, that's in Entre Marchands. So... You're up there, yeah. There we go. Okay. We go. Yeah. Let's start with number one here. Uh, one day a sales executive lent into the model of Broadgate. So um, the big tie, go ahead and let us know some of the details going on here. Well, this it was a big brochure that was uh, made for, well, was made on the Broadgate. Broadgate, it was a big property development in the city of London near Liverpool Street Station. And they wanted to do a, they wanted to do a brochure on the, um, on that, on, on building uh, Broadgate, basically, and on the ice rink in Broadgate. There was a central ice rink at one time, a round circular space within the property development that sat in the middle of it, the whole development. And I got to think of an idea how to show the, what was happening with the development at that time, show mm -hmm. the model of the future when it's finished of that development, and show the ice rink. I had to think of an idea to unite all those places. So I, I went away and did probably a big walk and obviously <laughs> stared at the ceiling in bed a few nights and came up with an idea where I photographed two, two men around the model, actually, yeah. for a corporate job a few, a few months ago but prior to this, to this photographic session. And they'd lent into the model for some reason to view it or whatever, and their tie had fallen in the model. And I remembered that their tie is falling in the model. So I went and proposed this idea for, for this brochure, which is a big, big uh, publication, beautiful, beautiful design by Peter Davenport and uh, Associates, Peter Davenport Associates with a design group involved with it. And um, yeah, we the, so therefore, I, we, we got a, a spotted tie for, for, for the so-called executive, probably just a, a model 
just a model, an extra, whatever. And he leant into the model and I photographed him leaning into the model. Yeah. No, it's, and then we're going to move from that image to, uh, we're going to go to number six here. Yeah, then, yeah, okay. Which really caught my attention. There's a high swing. Here. Yeah. here it is. Yeah, then uh, what happened, you see, was that we, we, we made two tires. One tire was six feet by two feet, which this is the tie. Yeah. And another tire was 40 feet. You're American, so you can understand what feet and inches are. <laughs> uh, 40 feet long by 20 feet wide. It came in its own truck. With this, what I decided to do was do the whole series in black and white. Okay. Because black and white would hide, can we say, the um, hide how uh, hide all the details in these make-believe tires or whatever. Right. And uh, I shot it against the light as well, mostly against the light and put a little bit of light back into the tie. Uh, I was trying to hide a lot of things really. And uh, this is just a small tie hanging by a, a lighting boom in front of the camera and fairly near the camera. I mean, probably only what, six feet away or eight feet away and then of course that was a far distant building none of this is photoshop it's all analog it's all done for real every every picture is a real photograph it's not played with photoshop was not invented was not invented then well the military might have had it but we never had it <laughs> this were you making a statement here of the working man in corporate the working man yes I start to build up um yeah, the working man, because we haven't got it on there, but eventually it ended up in National Portrait Gallery, the uh, the banners hanging down in Trafalgar Square near Nelson's Column in London had the image of that man that mm -hmm. is pointing at that that uh, that work there, that still working man. Yeah. It had him. He's there at a distance in this picture. I, I and the name you. and everything, whatever. It was a show at the National Portrait Gallery. Great motif of your work. Okay, so we're going to go from the big tie to the oh, black. Oh, you're not doing any more. Oh, right. Oh, yes, we can do... Uh, can you do one of the end shots to show, like, the... Because I lit the whole... Uh, yeah, there's a tie hanging... The six-foot tie again hanging over the top of Broad... Uh, the Liverpool Street Station. I'll go really quickly. You go to number, to, uh, number 11 or 12? Sure. Yeah. So we came down in reality, as you can see. The big tie came down, we going up with some, it fell down over all the traffic in Broadgate, in Bishopsgate, there it falls over the traffic. <laughs> and that is the big tie, that is the 20 foot by, you know, 60 or 80 foot tie. There they're carrying it as a, like, past all what they, how they progress with the building. And then you're going to go to number 11 or 12, whatever. Yeah. And then he grabs his ice skates. This thing the exactly upstairs, and he goes downstairs to to the. Uh, anyway, we, we've we've obviously edited the. He go down. I'm getting all excited about this, and then he skates on the outside. When those are all photographic students, and his big tie, the one I told you about, twenty foot by yes. six foot, is actually put on the steps of uh, of the ice rink, and the executive that was upstairs with his big tie has come down. Because he's lost his tie, his tie is those steps, as you right. can see, and he and he's got a guard of honor of photographic students oh, <laughs> uh, as he great. skates on the new outdoor ice rink in Broadgate. Yeah. Um, how do you remember how long that took? Uh, a week shoot, I think. Okay. Uh, I lit all that. I lit all that side of Broadgate. Yeah. That was one time I had to do a big lighting shot, not the biggest, but. One of the shots I did. I lit Broadgate five times, I think, or something. Massive area. That's a that's small area of probably 100 meters by 150 meters, you know? Yeah. And I love, I love the uh, spotlight right here. Yeah. Creating these shadows here and yeah. the almost triangular formation. Now, this is it's fantastic. Shall we move on to Black Kingdom? Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. Um, so as I'm scrolling to number 13, what was the idea, the notion behind Black Kingdom? It was financed by France, actually, by uh, 
um, by a, a Parisian ecological college. Um, and uh, I still want to do a project on the black country, so I've never photographed my home. And they, they thought it was a marvelous idea, but the problem was they, they didn't understand what the black kingdom meant, probably meant black people or something. I don't know what they felt the black kingdom was. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we did a book. I'm just going to, I don't know if you want to see this. This is the book, The Black Kingdom. If you want it, just contact me on my website, not my website, contact me, Brian at briangriffin.co.uk, and you can. Uh, you can find a copy of it by talking to me and I'll mail it to anybody who needs it. This is the Black Kingdom. Is that okay for me to show the book? Yeah? Absolutely. Okay. Share what you want. So this image, Water from Heaven. Yeah. Um, what's going on here? I don't know. I'm okay. I really like this picture I did. It's just yeah. my assistant in his heart and his hands, you know. Um I'm a bit, sorry, I'm a bit of a religious freak, really, as well. I don't know I'm a freak. I'm just, just <laughs> believing, believing things. I, I love I, I love religion. I, I, sorry, I don't like to put it, really. I'm yeah. just into, I believe somebody, you know, looks after me or something, I think, because I've been looked after for most of my life, really, by something that I don't know where it exists or what. I'm so happy about my life, so happy about most of it yeah obviously i've experienced bad things and good things and horrible things and good things but i i like life you know this this is about life really it's where, uh, the stuff of life sorry uh where was this shot i have no idea actually because it's it's quite it's quite a you know my career is so massive yeah and i'm getting so old i can't remember things yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, number. I like uh, it myself, actually. By the way, that's a good choice. Okay. Yeah. No, that one resonated with me. Number fifteen. It is uh, my mother. <laughs> well, my my mother was dead, unfortunately, when I did this project in 2010, 2010 and my mother had died in two thousand and eight, and I wanted my mother in the in this project, which is mm -hmm. about me going back to my home and that. And um, I had to find a woman that existed that looked like my mother at 30 years old. So I used a, a film casting lady <clears> that someone recommended me. And she found a woman that lived about 80 miles out of London in a place called uh, Leamington Spa. And she came down and Roger Burton styled her and uh, Liz Daxar did her hair and uh, did her makeup and I got some um, to be oil because my mother worked in a factory as I mentioned right. earlier right to represent a, a working woman an awful working awful to work in the factory and with all that detritus hanging from you and it was like a syrup you know it was just a it was just a, a molasses or something like that you know it's just yeah just like syrup really Golden syrup type of thing. I don't exactly what it was. Something Were you close like to your mom? I was, of course. All, all men are close to their mother. Mm -hmm. All women are, are close to their fathers, mostly. Mm -hmm. And I was close to my mother. Yeah. What did she instill in you? Um, what did she instill in me? A good I work think, ethic? I think she instilled in me, both my parents instilled in me a good work ethic. They were both workaholics. They mm -hmm. both, both worked incredibly hard mm -hmm. uh, at home and, uh, and at work. They worked seven days a week, my dad did. and My dad went to the pub every night, of course, and, uh, but my mother stayed at home, probably watched television most of the time. And, um, yeah, they worked so hard at the home and out in the in, in, the garden, they had massive gardens. Uh, they were both avid gardeners. Um, they had animals, loads of animals, they, as well as working in the factory. Yeah. Immense and hardworking people they were. So I followed them, really. That's all I do is just work all the time, I think. Yeah. That's a very striking image. All right, so we're going to go from 15 
to this next one. This will be number 19. The Woman Chainmaker. Yeah. That's, yeah, she's an extraordinary woman. Um, yeah, that was in a, a chain making factory. Um, her uh, n now husband um, was one of the directors or was the son of the owner of that chain making factory. It's an area called Cradley Heath and Cradley. They okay. they uh, they made the chain for the famous Titanic. Yes. Titanic. And uh, it's an area of chain which is basically died out now in the, in the area. It's just a little bit remaining. And so, um, so the anchors yeah. and chains were manufactured there. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the Titanic's anchor was was manufactured there. Massive thing drawn by I don't know how many horses it took to to. To get take it from the factory to the train station, I have no idea. There's loads of horses. Uh, so I have to okay. So I have to ask you about this this image right here. So we're getting her stare. When you set these, when you set these up, how do you get the participant to? relax into what you want them to capture through that lens. Do you do, do you do rehearsals? Do you like what, how give us that process? Um, maybe I'm an hypnotist. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I, I don't know what, what I possess. I mean, I, yeah. I've obviously got a character that makes people feel confident. And right. In my presence, my intimate presence, because yeah. a portraiture is, you know, you're only like eight, ten feet away from the subject, or even less, you know, sometimes two feet, three feet. I think, I don't know, it's just my character. I think it's what I'm made of. I think the way I, I'm so determined, so determined in a photographic session, I, I'm so involved in it. I, I'm really intensely involved in, in trying my best to, to get the best image possible from what I'm confronted with. And I think this rubs off on my subjects. Yeah, I'm not laissez-faire in any sense of the word. I'm really, really focused and concentrating my all my maximum effort. And I, I it's sort of sometimes it takes me a long time, maybe an hour, which I can regard as a long time. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, it's just my 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 intensity. I think the way you I know, am as a person. When I first saw this image, it re took me directly to Steven Spielberg's movie, Schindler's List. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, of the scene where they're in the ghetto and the little girl's walking across right. the, the beaten grounds. Right. And everyone else is in, you know, that kind of silvery black and white. And then she's in the, she's in a red coat, I believe. Right. And so um, I'm not saying you were going after the same thing, but that, it just struck me in that manner. So with the idea with her hair, um, was that something you already had kind of envisioned or you took the photograph and then you thought, okay, what am I going to play around with? No, I mean, it was uh, the stylist, again, who has played a major, major uh, part of my career over the last many number of years is Roger Burton, a stylist who lives in London, operates the Horse Hospital as an artistic venue, operates a uh, contemporary wardrobe as a clothes hire place. Um, he has been a major in influence on a few aspects like her hair and Liz Daxau was an incredible hairstylist and okay. Roger coupled with Liz Daxau, they could come up with like amazing ideas and they thought of that hairstyle. Uh, I just readily accept what they come up with because I, I respect them so much. And uh, right. yeah, they, they develop their hairstyle. It's, it's, it's a wonderful image. Um, shall we take a look at, would you like to look at um, early 70s? Yeah. Okay. I'll try and remember <laughs> 50 <laughs> years ago. I'll try um, and remember. 
So out of these 19 images, uh, okay. number three, here it is. Um, you know, there's something about this image that struck me, and I think it's a <laughs> this universal feel to it. I, I mean, I know, well, I don't know exactly what you were going for, but I had this feeling like, this seems to me like this could be shot almost in my neighborhood or a neighborhood in Oklahoma. Or So tell us a little bit about this one. This was a new town that was going to be built in the uh, early 70s. We, there were new towns springing up, really, uh, yeah. around Britain. And uh, this was Milton Keynes, which is in the sort of center of the country. It's okay. like about 50 miles out of London going sort of northwestish. Um, and this was just a, a simple shot of, of people living in this new town that was just, just being newly built. It's probably a slum now. I don't know, uh, but it was newly built then. Child doing, do you know, do you see that? I have what? no idea. Was there okay. a water pistol? Yeah. Oh, Okay. I Got can't it. see it there, but I... Yeah, I okay, okay. Um, and then we're going to look at number five. Right. This is the Rush Hour London Bridge. Oh, and if I'm not mistaken, one. this is one of... I mean, you have a lot of iconic photos, but this one I think people really, really appreciate. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. I mean, that just freaked me out when I took that. I mean, yeah. I don't know, it had been like a year, max, less than a year out of art college when I took that. And, of course, I've been watching Metropolis too much. <laughs> uh, and two, it's people going to work into the city of London. And, and three, Fritz Lang was obviously, and I, we were talking about shadows and we were right, talking right. about strong light and that. And uh, with like the German expressionist filmmaking, a little bit into that area, but... How I took that, I, I just got a taxi to drive me across the bridge slowly and I would take pictures through the rear window of the cab uh, of people go, coming to work in London. It was it was an editorial project for a magazine called Management Today okay. where I'd got to photograph people commuting into London, which was a million a day or two million a day. And uh, I just travelled by taxi, travelled by tube, travelled by bus, you know, from the position of the people that were traveling themselves. So that's how I approached that job. Yeah. I love that you captured the, almost the spine of the seats here, right? Yeah. Along the rails, yeah. With the rails. I just could not believe when I'd taken that. I just like, I believed in, I believed I could be a photographer. It, it taken a long time. I had not got the self-confidence at all. I mean, i sort of badging my way through photography college, blundered my way through being an amateur photographer, but I didn't really, really know if I could really be any good at it. But so, that's what I've got to do. I've got to prove myself and I've got to make a go of it. But when I took that, I knew I could do it. It was such a relief, great relief. Did you know at that moment, if you, if you can remember at that moment, oh my goodness, I've got it right here. I knew it at that moment. Yeah. I almost like, I was, all my body was like full of like some energy, you know. Yeah. I don't know why it's incomprehensible. Uh, like it's on fire. I was on fire after I'd taken that image. I was um, literally burning all over and with, now, with excitement, I think, and relief, a, a, a combination of relief and excitement. So what is rush hour now like? <laughs> I think across that bridge is probably the same. Yeah. Um, although the people, I mourn the fact that people don't look, they look so messy today. <laughs> we all look so messy today. They all look so, so regimental in those days. Yeah. No, that's a great one. Ah. Yeah. 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 Well, this one haunts me a little bit. <laughs> well, I, I, I was working um, like the design director of management today. He came from Basel. He was a German, but he was he came from Basel. 
Uh-huh. Uh, when I say he was German, I think he was German. Right? Uh, but he could have been, he was Swiss. He worked in Switzerland on Droop magazine. And he came to uh, London and uh, worked on management today. Um, he, he never came on any photo. I would just present my photographs to him as a fait accompli, really, I must admit. This was a, a, an assignment he gave me to, uh, to photograph foreign cars entering Britain. Mm-hmm. These were the early days of mass importation of foreign cars into, into Britain, really. And I decided, I always tried to think of a, a different way of shooting things. And uh, I decided to, to get on top of the car transporters that were delivering them around the country yeah. and photograph you know, part of the car, like this one, uh, looking out into the landscape from being on the top level of the transporter. And it worked particularly well, especially in this case. And then I was very fortunate. What do you call, you call luck? You need luck in photography. Is that there's a big aerodrome, a big Second World War aerodrome in Kent called Manston, which is on the horizon there. And they don't use it as a military aerodrome anymore. It's just like, I don't know, it's a big runway, massive runway. That's all I know about it. But they were doing fire practice of aeroplanes, of aeroplane caught on fire in the distance. Yeah. And that was really lucky that I got that, that those fires of these aeroplanes being in fire practice, being put out of, uh, put out of uh, putting the fire out in, in the aeroplanes. And uh, yeah, and that was that. Uh, there's a woman walking down the street. I can't see it here. It's a woman walking down that street. I can't see her. Anyway, yeah. The What would you suggest to people who are thinking about uh, photography as a career? What are some little nuggets of advice you can give? Well, I, you guys, I always stop to the way. I mean, I was excited about myself, as I mentioned earlier. I was excited that I could look at things and do things differently. I yeah. found that out through doing, being, becoming a professional photographer. Immediately I'd found out, well, within a year I'd found it out. As I said to you before, I didn't feel I could become one, and I found out that I could. Uh, become a, a decent photographer and I've always stuck all my career to, to the way I see the world it's been it's I've gone through a very rocky career a rocky career it, it look, might not appear like that now where people have not liked what I've done people have been upset with what I've done people have rejected what, what I've done some people have liked it some people have accepted it but I've had a very rocky road but I've always stuck to the way I go about things. I've never let myself be eroded yeah. by opinions. I don't let opinions erode the way I do things. I know what I want to do, and I do it, basically. <laughs> you can lump it or leave it. Uh, and it's worked out to, to my benefit that my career is still relatively flourishing, yeah. and the work I've done in the past is flourishing. Um, in terms of public notoriety or public acceptance now, more so than back then. So I'd say stick to your guns. Yeah. Stick to the way that you you go about things. Stick to the, what you believe in. Don't deviate away. Just stick to what you feel. It's so important. That's the most important thing you could ever do in photography. Don't keep on looking at photographs and trying to follow somebody else. Follow your own way. Believe in your own way. Because it probably could be so different to other people. It's good. In, inevitably, you are a different person to any other human being in the world. Right. So, I mean, you must have a vision somewhere deep inside. It's just right. getting it out, really. I, I definitely want to do Moscow 1974. Okay. Okay. Um, are people staying with us or are they bored? Yeah, <laughs> we got some students left in the classroom. <laughs> All right, so I definitely I have to start with this one. Uh, did you were you did you go to Moscow by yourself on this? I went trip? with uh, with people who lived in the the flat that I lived in. Uh, we were a set of students, ex students, I should say, okay. that lived in a flat in London together. Yeah, and uh, we all I think there were only one, two, I think there were four, including myself. Uh, that went to Moscow 
on a on a on a sort of like a weekend, not a weekend. It was a, a short trip, like three days or four days there, you know, um, in Moscow. And it was only by luck that the, they were doing the uh, the celebrations they were doing, you know. Um, um, I, that's I, a building. I, I I start that as number one of fourteen, and uh, I heard a whistle next to me well in front of me uh -huh. when i started photographing that building and a soldier with a rifle and a dog a big dog like an alsatian dog who was running towards me he said something and, and, and i had to follow him he either grabbed me by the coat or whatever <laughs> and took me down into the into the bowels of that building and i, I went down a long corridors to, to meet an officer in a room on his own at the far end of a fairly large room yeah. and uh, he was sitting behind a desk with, with his military cap on and his uniform and he kept demanding for my passport but I didn't have it because the hotel had my passport uh, when I was staying it was an in-tourist hotel and, but they let me off I thought I was going to go to jail or something uh, yeah it was really scary and they let me off and I gave I, I smoked in those days and I gave the soldier a cigarette and I had a cigarette to steady out <laughs> my nerves and he let me go, you know. Yeah. Breaking I was always in three or four times when I was there in a space of two or three days. <laughs> yeah. See, yeah, okay, so we're going to move to, uh, it's the woman. Oh, the, sorry. Okay, this one. Well, that's the story. And Henri Cartier-Bresson, a famous photographer, had, uh, had photographed in Moscow in 1955 and done a book called Moscow. Uh -huh. um, I, I tried to beat, take a better photograph than he'd ever taken in all his book, which was probably 100 and odd pages. And I think I managed it with this picture by sheer luck again, you know, yeah. by sheer work, working so hard, trying to beat his photographs. And... Um, yeah, I took that at the Museum of um, Space Exploration or the Conquerors of Space. It was a snowy day. It was a wet, slushy day uh, with the snow coming down. And uh, he was sliding down this uh, like angled uh, edifice, you know, uh, of this monument. And uh, he was just sliding down with his executive case. Yeah. It's a nice oh. picture. A lot of people like that picture. Oh, just it's amazing absolutely amazing and i love the shadows here the reflection yeah so, thank you um, yeah that was the, uh, i walked up the street as this procession of all these nuclear weapons it was one of the last before they started again last year was it they uh there was only back then in 74 was the last parade of nuclear inter intercontinental ballistic missiles until yeah last year I must say. and this woman had committed some crime I don't know if she was a pickpocket or what she was that this uh, uh, this well uh, policeman mm -hmm. uh, it's, it admonished her you know like really telling her you know off for doing something terrible That's she obviously right. did something like a petty crime she'd committed right. and it's a policeman telling her off yeah and you captured at the right moment. Do you remember this gentleman? Was he friends with her? I have no idea. As I was walking up the street where there were lots of um, lots of people viewing the procession yeah. on the occasion, and um, I, I had no idea. I saw this happening, so I quickly clicked it. <laughs> clicked it, yeah. And did you know at that time, kind of like the one in the, the black cab, that you knew, okay, I've got something here, very striking. Very I, did, I, I was very cold. dismissive of this. I was, the, the pictures I liked were the man sliding down, which you've yeah. chosen, and yeah. were the people in front of looking at that museum exhibition with the clouds and things about about five earlier from this this shot here. Uh, you have done quite an extensive amount of work with some <laughs> well-known, universally well-known artists. Um, here we have Brian May, Brian Eno. Uh, you and I were talking about 
Mr. Eno, a little bit before. Uh, when was this shot? Ooh, good question. Um, good question. It was in the 80s. Yeah. I think towards the end of the 80s, actually. Um, I think it was. I mean, I can tell you. I'll just get the book pop. Or tell me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you listen to Brian Eno's work? I do, yeah. I do. So, um, yeah, you, I, you just asked me a question. Oh, there we go. It, it was year 1990. Okay. Yeah, carry on. Um, so I just saw an interview recently with Brian Eno two nights ago. Yeah. Uh, and when I was watching it, I was saying, oh, I have a question for... Uh, Brian Griffin when I speak with him. So here's my question. Okay. From what you know of Brian Eno, either as a person, as an artist, what have you, how, are, how, how is your work similar to his work in any fashion? I know he doesn't take photographs per se, like you do, but in creating music, in the work that you do as an artist, how would you say your work is anywhere similar? That's an interesting question. I never thought of it. I mean, my desire to listen to him, um, mm -hmm. obviously he connects with me in some way. Yeah. I do listen to what he's doing. And he's done many things. Um, obviously from the beginnings with Rocks and Music right up to the present day and uh, through his more ambient albums and everything. I, I, I get the feeling he's a real, he's a man that's, that is really explorative uh, in the terms of, I think he's also a, a real geek, you know, <laughs> he's really into precision. I think he's really precise about everything. He was very, and I think I'm, I'm very free with people. Uh, in, if people want things, then I tend to let them do it. You know, if people have ideas, I tend to go along with it, whatever. And when I went to see him, he was in this detached house with grounds around Woodbridge, um, which is the other side of uh, Ipswich. And um, I think he lives there now for some reason. And uh, he just let me do it. I, used to, I, had to get, I, I just wanted to photograph him. I've just created a door where I could go inside his brain, really. I regret, it's, a, it's a double exposure. Yeah. Um, Brian's Brian, my, one of my techniques. It's a, it's a, let's talk about it, really. I think I don't know. It's a fabulous shot. So we go from uh, very right throw away. Clash yeah. here. Were you a big That's Clash a, fan? I wasn't a Clash fan. Okay. Uh, I wasn't a Clash fan. Um, I was for the Radio Times mid mid seventies. I think around about seventy five, seventy six. Uh, they frightened me, really. Well, it was it was the big punk year. It was seventy six, wasn't it? Was it seventy six? Can't remember. Um, they frightened me, really. Um, I was a young man then, and they were pretty scary. I felt. Yeah. Uh, although they, they were probably harmless, you know. <laughs> uh, it was in a round house. It was a concert venue in London. Yeah. Yeah. Famous. And um, yeah, that was the beginning of their career and the beginning of my career. Not a particularly creative image, it's just very much a, a picture. You're going now into America. You're going now yeah. to D.D. Ramon. Yeah, I want to, because we talked a little bit off this conversation about American music and your yeah. appreciation for it. So you, you obviously you spoke about um, Bob Dylan, but did you get into the Ramones? Did you oh, really? Yeah, I did, yeah. I did. I was in Baltimore. That was in a big hotel in Baltimore. And... Um, was it Baltimore? Was it the Biltmore Hotel? It says Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, sorry. The Biltmore Hotel, Atlanta. Yeah. I remember going to this massive hotel, and I, I, I've got to find DD in this massive hotel. And I was told the floor he was in, but I think the hotel manager incorrectly gave me the wrong Ramones door. <laughs> and I went to the door, and then I knocked on the door, and at the door came came at the door inside his room, he opened the door and it was, it was Joey. I 
was like so again a bit scared of Joey. You know, he was like a tall, lanky guy. And uh, Joey said, "No, Dee Dee's down there, or something like that." And anyway, Dee Dee came downstairs, as you can see, with his girlfriend. Yeah. And um, and he's a lovely man, Dee Dee. Beautiful man. I really enjoyed photographing Dee Dee. That was for. Uh, for a Canadian magazine called Weekend, which still exists apparently in Canada, given away as like a colour supplement in, in a lot of the newspapers at that time. And I was just going doing my tour of America, really. So I have, um, okay, so I have to ask you this question in, 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 sh in doing that shot right there. When you take a photograph of musicians, is the music playing in your head at all? trying to capture the energy in the essence or is it you just completely tune out their music and it's like okay i've got a skyline i've got this building yeah i completely tune out of music okay i don't even think about the album cover or about a record or anything yeah. music doesn't play in my head doesn't have any effect on me whatsoever okay. it's what i'm confronted with in reality what's in front of me yeah. that I'm interested in. And I'm also interested in the second thing, that is doing a job, if it's a job like this was, that the client really likes what I'm doing. I'm going to do my, my thing, but I pray and hope that the client likes it. Uh, yeah. We, so you, I, let's let's, um, let's kind of slowly close the curtains on this conversation with your big kickstarter campaign right what is that all about it's all about it's called crowdfunding and crowdfunding is to help artists generate enough money by asking the general public having the internet at their disposal or having social networks at their disposal to generate enough interest in what they the artist is doing that the general public will help in their own small way uh, to fund to fund the project. And I've asked the general public to fund Mode, which is on Kickstarter. It's called, it's a book about Depeche Mode, about the work I did with them, which was from about 81 to 86. I did about, I did six albums actually in all, five very famous ones and six albums. And um, I've asked the general public to fund this book. It's a beautiful book designed by the people that did my, another great book, which I, I, I still love. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's about myself, which is <laughs> The Black Kingdom, which I brought out in, when was that? During lockdown, you know, yeah. about three or four years ago. And um, yeah, that was the, the second biography of, of all my work that I did between 1969 and 1990. And that was funded the same way, and it's going to be designed by the same company that designed my earlier book, The Black Kingdom. So uh, you can find your designer you can, or your designers. You can find your printers. You have the choice of everything. Yeah. You are like the boss of, of your project, so you can make that book exactly how you want to make it, exactly how you want to make it, so, exactly so the right paper, everything. Sorry, the right cover, hard or soft or whatever. Go on. Sorry. With, with mode, how how far along are you in this campaign? Are you achieving your goal? How much further do you have to go? I have achieved the basic. I've achieved the basic funding I requested, which was thirty thousand English pounds. Congrats. And I've reached above that, which is within the space of two weeks, which I'm absolutely delighted. So I know this book is now going to happen. It will involve me incredibly. I've got to mail all the books out. Um, I've got to manage the whole process of printing, of designing. I've got to collaborate with so many other people that will be involved, like printers and designers, for instance. And I'm going to have to post it. I have to package it. I have to decide. On the, on the cardboard box it fits in. I have to sign every single book. And I also have to put every single person in the book because that is one of the criteria that I mentioned 
would actually be a, would actually be a part of this whole production. So people will have their name in the book. I will sign every single book. So I've got a tremendous amount. I've got a box set. I've got a label it. I've got to send it out. I have a friend called um, called Vaughan. Vaughan oh, Yunsen, yeah, sure. Who is going to help me through this project? Is going to really support me. He has supported me and supported me for a number of years. He produces all those beautiful posters of mine. And uh, he's going to sit alongside me and go through this arduous process. But we will go through it. We will make it perfect. And we have some magic items that have now come into play on this book. We have, I did a, a movie because I, I told you earlier that I made movies between, movies meaning pop videos or wow. ads uh, between 1990 and uh, 2002. And um, 2002, 2003. We have had the, the man who is the, uh, the costumier and the production designer for only When I Lose Myself, mm -hmm. which was a promo I was called to do for Depeche Mode in 1997. And he did a journal on that, on that experience, on shooting out there, because he costumed everything and he designed the shoot, a lot of the shoot, the sets, whatever. And um, I was the director of that pop video and um, he's produced a journal and I've got 14 pages of his journal to go through which a part of it will be a man that was there at the time it was made who was part of the crew got it in the book which will be some magic thing which I didn't know existed I mean that is being that is like 18 years ago 17 18 years ago but now I found it and it's going to be in the book in okay. almost its entirety Fantastic. Which fantastic, which is yeah. a fantastic thing to happen. So for our fans out there who love Depeche Mode, and I know that, as we were talking earlier, like just this ravenous, right? And this ravenous love and this voracious appetite for this band. Um, in working with them, uh, what struck you about them as, as just people? Um, I like to think as people, they respected fellow artists. Okay. They always left me to get on with my thing. They tended to have minimum impact on anything I did with them, mm -hmm. uh, apart from maybe, you know, initiating an idea that we developed together or whatever. Yeah. And they were great people to work with, uh, great people. Who just, I just went off and did my the album cover. So I just did whatever I, I fancied doing with the subject matter they agreed upon initially, obviously. They were just so good at letting me get on with things. I mean, Anton now, who is mostly involved with them, Anton Corbett, must find it wonderful to work with so, a band that respects a fellow artist wow. to just do his thing. And that's what he really did with me. And at the time from 81 to 86, you said? Did you Absolutely. Get, did you get a sense of, I mean, they were starting to obviously become and evolve into, you know, these well-known musicians. Did you get a sense at that time, okay, this band is going to kind of take over the world? No, no. not that, uh, no way. I just adopted each each project I was involved in as an opportunity for me to, to do the best photography I possibly could in the situation I mean, with the idea I, I was confronted with, especially the album covers I'm talking about, of course. Yeah, right. And then tell us a little bit about your connection to, okay, so this is, this is the one that a lot of people are familiar with. Your connection to the working man, the connection to um, growing, you know, the understanding of the black country. Was that all kind of pre-planned in, the, in these images here? I think Depeche Mode also helped towards that. They realized what my work was about. I think they were clever enough, especially Daniel Miller, who was their manager at the time. Yeah. Um, really used 
I don't know, what I was really interested in to make their covers. And it worked out really well, you know, because the images are a little bit Soviet, you know, especially the early ones. So they're, they're, the images could be on album covers in all the shops of the Soviet Union, which was very helpful for Depeche Mode, where a lot of other bands didn't do album covers that were appropriate, can we say, to sit in the front front of shops in the Soviet Union. But these I, I love this because the little um, caption says, I will never forget Daniel Miller's face when he saw these images for the first time on my light box. Yeah. yeah. He was just... Like a light bulb, he was glowing like, <laughs> like a light bulb, <laughs> and I can understand it. It's, I mean, a broken frame. Excuse me for being rather boastful, but it's yeah. probably one of the most famous photographs in the world today. Really, probably is. I mean, I, I know that's hard to say because I, 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 I don't know. I, I do want to ask you, like, um, so here we go. The world's best photographs, 1980, yeah. 1990. So I do, I do have to ask you that very simple but maybe hard question. If that is true to you and to a lot of people, how does that make you feel? That you clicked and worked on one of the most historical, iconic images in, in art. Well, I can say that when you click, yeah, as you had to, and you had Polaroids in those days to see what you were going to click um, in your back of your camera. You are absolutely filled with so much energy that goes all through your body, just explodes within you internally. Yeah, and that's when we're talking about religiosity or whatever religion, or whatever. Something is, something makes makes this happen. You think I, I don't know if I if I control the situation, you know. I, maybe I did, or maybe I was I was just producing something that would like a vessel, you know, it's like a vessel, just like a tube, just ran down the tube and came out into the world. Did somebody determine all these things for me? I, I can't believe it. I just cannot believe that I actually did a lot of the things I did do. Cannot believe it. I'm so was so blown away myself with my own work. Do, were you ever a teacher of a photography class? No. I mean, okay. at times I applied to universities okay. to, for teaching jobs, but they didn't accept me. They didn't want me. Oh. <laughs> but, but having said that, I, I am a I, 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 I have got a claim. You know, obviously I'm. A, <laughs> I'm a professor and a doctor, but um, apart from that, I mean, they didn't want me. I mean, I don't think they wanted me around. They didn't want this bundle of bloody energy, <laughs> this bundle of energy, you know, oh, every them. day in their departments. I mean, it would drive them crazy. Yeah. I mean, they don't want to know. They just want to lace up on a lot of things. They don't, I don't know. They're not going to be horrible. No. So let's go to the Bunnymen real quickly. The tungsten lights were switched on. The magic hour was happening as the daylight faded. However, it was impossible to get the band out of the local pub, so we missed it. <laughs> Very true. I was really annoyed with them. That was the band I fell in love with. This band, I did fall in love with them. Oh, I love that caption. But, I mean, it's true, that caption. I, you know, because I wanted the daylight and my lights to combine together into a, a photograph. In, in a positive way, what's the diff what was the difference of working with Depeche Mode versus Echo and the Bunnymen? <clears throat> well, Echo and the Bunnymen became my friends. Mm -hmm. I thought I was like the, the fifth Bunnyman, you know. Yeah. Um, whilst with Depeche Mode, I had a, a disconnection with them both, apart from meeting them in the studio, uh, yeah. their recording studio. I never got to know them as people, really. Got it. Just got to know them as clever men or uh, musicians or whatever you might want to say. But while with the Bunnymen, I, I felt I felt I was so near to them, you know, I was like part of them. And of course I was disappointed once again because the Bunnymen left me as well, as you probably know. <laughs> we worked with the same photographer, Anton Corbin. Right, right. <laughs> Look, I lost both Echo and the Bunnymen and uh, Depeche Mode to Anton. We, he's great, Anton. I, I'm nothing yeah. against him. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I lost both of them, you know. 
Uh, I do have to ask you about this gentleman. Oh, that's very sad, isn't it? Yeah. So what was what was he like? He was a very, very delicate, sensitive, but also extremely naughty man. He was naughty. a very naughty man, but very <laughs> naughty in a, in a nice way, not, not, nothing criminal or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. Just like naughty. But he was also a very gentle and sensitive and quiet man as well. And the fact that you say quiet is, to me, obviously a contrast to his drumming. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, it's smooth drumming. and slick, and, and, but his drumming, the, the pounding. Oh, incredible. Uh, the natural, organic pounding. I got a sense that. Uh, and then uh, this one, prior to shoot, we see the band with Tungsten Lion that we would later use for the album cover photograph. So how long did this shot take? Everyone was freezing to death. Yeah. It was on top of a, a small hill, a very cold evening. Yeah. Um, people were like, I mean, they, another cold evening because they went to Iceland as well and had a super cold evening. <laughs> um, it, was, well, it wasn't the evening, was it? It was during the day. Super, it was super cold. It was like evening all day in Iceland. But, um, yeah, really, really cold. There were any young boys then. I mean, how old yeah. were they? Like 17, 18? Uh, I don't even think in their 20s, yeah. Someone can correct us. Yeah, someone can correct us. They seem terribly young, young to me. Do people go to these sites and say, hey, Brian, take a look at this image? <laughs> the only one site I know that people visit is the Steelworks, where you've okay. got some great reward for okay. the album cover. I know people have been there because it's, uh, it's on the internet. Uh, yeah, you know, the fans do go there, uh, but the other places they they must do, but I haven't I haven't seen it that they have. So, kind of like the Brian Eno question, which one of the Bunnymen do you relate to the most or connect with? Or well, the only, the only Bunnyman I'm distantly um, close to is uh, Les Patterson. Okay. Who's the bass guitarist down on the bottom left? Yeah, and Will Sargent, who is the guy, the lead guitarist, who I think is incredibly creative. Yeah, as well, incredibly creative guitarist. We did an album together. Uh, my album, we just I was just messing around and we recorded it um, in Liverpool of uh, guitar. I played a guitar and he did. I can't play a guitar, by the way, but he made me sound good. Um, yeah, he, uh, I suppose Mac, you know, the singer yeah. in yeah. McCulloch, he wrote the introduction to a book I did in 86, 86 called Open. He wrote the introduction to it. And he, he, I said, well, you write the introduction to this book, Mac. And he said, and he looked up into the sky. Yeah. It was a, a, a clear night and there were all stars in the sky. It was a clear, clear, no clouds. And he looked up at the, at the clouds and he went, a sky more silver than black. Oh. And that's all he said. And I put that in the book. What a great thing to say. Yeah. I remembered it and put it down. Oh, it's only two lines anyway. A sky more silver than black. Incredible. I'm He's loving a great artist. Sorry. I, I, I'm loving and appreciating all these little narratives that you're sharing. We're going to wrap this up in just a couple minutes. Um, now, I believe this album, Heaven Up Here, just had an anniversary. That's right. Yeah. So give us a little uh, background on this glorious shot. Yeah. The, the, a famous studio, which still exists, is called Rockfield. And I think it's in Monmouthshire. I'm not dead certain because I haven't been down there for many years. It's near Wales anyway. And the nearest coast near to Rockfield that we, we knew about was a, a coast near Barry Island, called, well, Porth Corp and Barry Island in that sort of area. And um, and the record company, Rob Dickens of Corova Records, asked me to to get loads of seagulls, you know, and get the Bunnymen photographed with seagulls. Yeah. So we got a lot of fish, pieces of fish in that, you know, in plastic bags, stomp the place out. <laughs> Tom, so we had a man with a, like an Arab headdress on, ran across the across the beach in front of the bunnymen and yeah. chopped all this 
all of these bits of internal organs or pieces of fish on the beach and waited for the seagulls to come down. They wouldn't come down anywhere near the band. They were scared of the band. They didn't come. And they, only, they were distant, distant in front of the band. <clears throat> so I couldn't get the seagulls going over the top and flying around them. And so I, I did this, and there were silhouettes of, of the body men with distant seagulls. When I took that to the rocker company, they went berserk. You in a good way, right? In, in, not in a necessarily a good way. They, you, you've ignored what we wanted you to do, which was the seagulls. And the bunny men. We want to see what the bunny men look like. Mac is beautiful, remember? Right, right. We want to see what he looks like, you know, and we want to see the gulls flying around the top of Mac or whatever. But then they, they seem to grow and like it. I mean, if you can imagine, their band was silhouetted and, and um, they, they liked it. And um, they produced a, one of the albums, you no know, singles was the goals or the posters about the album were just close-ups of the goals flying around uh, which obviously are photographed as well as the band uh you know what i love about this image is um there's so many aspects to it but i don't know it definitely i mean obviously heaven up here the religious undertone but them kind of i don't know the walking on the water Simple. Right. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. I've always wanted to know, but I mean, to me, it was a simple picture. I couldn't. <laughs> it. And then it got, it's got so famous, you know. Yeah. Oh, why is it so Why does everyone like it? I didn't know why everyone liked it. No idea at all. I so didn't think it would. It was a simple shot, you know. Yeah. In these shots with the bunny men, um, where, where is it? Oh, this one. You're obviously a Bunny Men fan. Yeah, I'm a, I'm, a, oh, I'm a big fan of a lot of the uh, artists that you've worked with. Um, this just, this just, I mean, I, it looks very frigid, but this just looks like a great shoot. We nearly all died uh, on that shoot. <laughs> um, we all jumped in a, a long black um, Peugeot estate that could house the four of them, me and my assistants, and... It was a seven-seater, yeah. an easy seven seats, and and I, I remember going to like um, like a road junction and going over the road junction, and a truck, a big truck, just missed us. Really fractions, you know, horns blasting, and just a big Arctic truck just missed us, writing my car off, you know, yeah. with the bunny men. We nearly all died together, me and the bunny men. Yeah. That, that that would have been a very unique story there. Um, I'm going to close this out if you don't mind. In here, and there we are. Okay. Uh, let's see. I just want to read a couple comments here. Uh, Eleanor says, "I'm also a wannabe photographer." Michael Prince says, "It's a beautiful book." Uh, Tomas says, "This is awesome. Glad you're enjoying it." And then Eleanor says, "This name." Ramon Zabalza Ramos. Wow. And then Tina says, hey, Brian, really fun listening to listen. Always some new things. Uh, Beso from Tbilisi says hi, and I am sending hugs. Hope we see each other in Who's Arlen. That? Who was yeah. that? Tina Shellhorn. Oh, yeah, she's a great mate out of Cologne. Yeah, she's one okay. of my dear friends. Go back a long time. Uh, Eva says, thank you so much. Brilliant. Um, okay. So we're going to end what's coming down the line after this mode collection. Do you have something else in the works? Well, we didn't touch on that. Well, you have a, it's a book called Gary. I'm going to put Gary uh, out there next year to crowdfund. Okay. And that's my next big project. But also I'm working because I've become the ambassador of the Swiss watch, as you know, um, as most people know. Uh, I'm going over to do a book of, of their company in Switzerland right. next week, no, week after next. You're a busy man. I am, yeah. I love it. I love yeah. every minute of my life. I'm so happy. I hope I live a long time. <laughs>
Well, you've done some extraordinary work. And as far as living for a long time, I have no doubt because you're doing what you love. Your images yeah. will endure the test of time. This has been an incredible conversation. And being a teacher myself for many years of elementary students, uh, it has been great being a student uh, and learning about your work. And um, again, can you remind everyone about real quickly the Kickstarter? How can they find that to help yeah. fund it? Please go on Kickstarter, which is K-I-C-K, -K, you know, Kickstarter in English, Kickstarter, uh, and uh, look for, put Brian Griffin Mode, M-O-D-E. Okay. Brian Griffin Mode, and it'll pull up on, on, on your computer or your smartphone or your tablet. You'll see Mode, and then you just pledge whatever you'd like to pledge, whether it's a pound, 10 pounds, 50 pounds, 500 pounds, you just, or 30 or 40 or whatever, just pledge something towards the book. It would really help us. Thank you very much for, for listening to me dribble, dribble and, 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 and uh, I don't know. Not at all, not at all. all. Not all the time about my work. Thank you for, for listening. Absolutely. And thank you to our participants um, so much for tuning in. My name is W.A.K. William, host of the High Art on the Edge page. I connect with artists all over the world, photographers, musicians, painters, writers, you name it, and have these amazing conversations to learn not so much I mean, about their craft, but who they are as people. And I got a great sense of who you are today, Brian. So thank you thank for you. your time and best of luck and uh, success to you. Take care, everyone. Keep paying attention to high art. It's always right in front of your eyes. Take care. Ciao.